In 2006, Atlas Co. In 2006, Atlas Core was founded to address critical social issues by developing leaders, strengthening organizations, and promoting innovations through an overseas fellowship and virtual learning programs of skilled professionals from around the world. Our community began with an inaugural class of six fellows who hailed from Colombia and India. In 15 years, Atlas Core has empowered 1,000 leaders from 104 countries, partnered with 300 host organizations, U.S. embassies and our network of supporters to multiply impact domestically and worldwide. Atlas Core leaders represent the richness of diversity, inclusion and cultural awareness. Now, more than ever, we need to keep building bridges between social change leaders from around the world. During our 15th anniversary year, Atlas Core continues to engage social change leaders as fellows and virtual scholars. Our fellows serve in the United States and virtually from their home regions. Virtual scholars enhance their professional skills, build global networks, and prepare for leadership in home communities during our Virtual Leadership Institute, a new online leadership development program launched by Atlas Core in 2020. This year, we invite you to celebrate with us our 15th anniversary. Thank you for supporting our community of global change makers. Thank you for supporting Atlas Core. Hello there. Uh, thanks for joining us today. My name is Zach Morris and I'm the Senior Manager of Global Engagement here at Atlas Core. I'm also here with three of our Communication and Marketing Fellows, Shinjini, Miguel, and Busayomi. And we're really excited to tell you about Atlas Core, um, as well as give you tips for being a successful candidate to the fellowship. Uh, today's um, live webinar will be focused on um, marketing and communications. Um, so we're really excited to tell you about that. Um, so first, a little bit about Atlas Core. Um, we engage leaders committed to social change in 12 to 18 months, professional fellowships at organizations to learn best practices, build organizational capacity, and return home to create a network of global change makers. Fellows serve full-time at host organizations in the United States, addressing issues competent to their expertise. They increase their leadership skills through hands-on experience while developing invaluable connections to learn effective practices. The fellowship is open to people worldwide who are not currently living in the U.S., um, have at least a bachelor's degree and two years of experience, and are 35 years old or younger. I also want to tell you about our special focus for late 2021 and early 2022 fellowships. We are currently prioritizing applicants who have skill sets where there's a strong demand. These leaders should have at least two years of experience in communications and marketing, partnerships building and business development, monitoring evaluation and data analysis, or technology and engineering. If your experience falls outside of these skill sets, don't worry, you're still invited to apply, but may experience longer wait times during the vetting process. The full list of skill areas where we typically place fellows can be found in the frequently asked questions section of our website. This webinar, again, is going to highlight our fellows and alumni whose fellowship focused on communication and marketing roles. As a fellow in communications and marketing, you could be creating engagement engaging content, managing social media, and developing marketing campaigns to increase visibility and engagement at mission-driven organizations. We have a page that highlights our opportunities in communications and marketing, um, which could be found at Atlas Core communications-marketing, and we will go ahead and post that in the chat. Um, now, um, feel free to ask your questions in the comments, and we'll respond at the end. Um, now you'll get to hear from our fellows um, who can speak about their experience in uh, different communication and marketing roles at their host organizations. So I'm really excited to um, introduce our um, three fellows, again, Miguel, um, <clears throat> Shinjini, and Busayomi. Um, 
So go ahead. Uh, we're going to start with a, an atlas for tradition, uh, which is our five facts. Um, so we'll have Miguel go ahead and get started to introduce himself. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, perfect. So hi, I'm very excited to be here and share the floor with Wissayome Shinjini and of course with you, Zach. Um, my name is Miguel Aguirre. I'm an Atlas Core Fellow, Class 29. My, my host organization is the American Red Cross, was the American Red Cross. And uh, my anecdote was that I love to swim. Uh, unfortunately, I can, I, 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 I was not, a, I haven't been able to swim during this pandemic year because this, the swimming pools are not open. <laughs> But uh, I felt like every time I, I struggle in the water, it was for me like a step moving forward. So it was more like a philosophical uh, uh, fact fact for me, not, not so fact, but, but more philosophical. It's like, it's like to moving forward every stroke I, I move. And that's how I feel my life, that every step you do, like applying for this fellowship is, uh, you take more advantage in the whole area in, the, in, the, in your surroundings to move forward. Amazing. Thanks, Miguel. Uh, Shinjini, go ahead and uh, let us know what your five facts are. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Shinjini. I'm an Atlas Core Fellow from India. Uh, I'm currently uh, placed at SAP, and uh, because of the pandemic, I'm serving from home right now in India. Uh, a social issue that I'm passionate about is uh, equal education and opportunities for all. A fun fact, not really so fun, a colorful fact about me is that I always have a stash of 10 colored, 10 colored pens with me and I don't write in simple blue. It's always pink and purple and green and other colors for me. I love that fun fact. That is fun <laughs> and colorful. <laughs> Thank you, Shinjini. <laughs> All right, Busayomi, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself to our watchers <laughs> with your five facts. <laughs> Awesome. You're hello, amazing. everyone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was. Thank you. So, hello, everyone. It's good to be here today, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Busayo Mishotunde. I am an Atlas Core Fellow from Nigeria. I served at um, Transparency and Accountability Initiative in Washington, D.C., and the social issues I care about are good governance, rural development, and youth development. Fun fact about me is that I used to teach, and I still love teaching, and I might be teaching in the future. Who knows? Amazing, teaching um, everyone about, <laughs> about our fellowship, but in general, great to hear that. Uh, perfect. Well, my first question um, is going to be for Miguel, um, and I just would love to hear from you. What were you doing before the fellowship, and what made you decide to apply to Atlas Core? Oh, thanks for that question. And, and I think that's the opportunity to complete my five facts that I forgot because I was very excited to tell them. <laughs> so I'm from Ecuador. I'm from Quito, Ecuador. Uh, my social issues have been oh, as Busayomi, child, children education, basically. And that's what I was doing before. I was working for an for a NGO, which was linked to a private company named Telefonica. And um, I had some already a regional experience, I could say, because I was working with uh, Latin American region, uh, specifically of Ecuador, of course, Latin American region and, and Spain. And I was a, community, a communication manager. So my work was to develop different projects, educational projects, basically, to um, decrease, um, reduce the digital literacy, for example, in children and uh, some campaigns uh, against the child labor, for example. And after eight or nine years, almost nine years of my experience here in, in my country and with the region, I decided that I just wanted to go uh, wider. So at some point, it's like I want to learn more things. And I, one thing that happened to me that really struck me, I could say, is the earthquake that we have in, in, in 2016 here in, in, in Ecuador because I saw so many things that we can prevent, that we can work before, that we can uh, be prepared in terms of disasters. 
And when I was looking for an opportunity to increase my knowledge and work on communication risk, for example, that's when I when Atlas Corp came to my life because actually the American Red Cross was um, promote this it's this position on uh, at the global disaster preparedness center which is host organization between the federation and the american red cross and it's, it was specifically to prepare people in disaster so that was my that's that was my key point when i decided to apply and and and, and here i am and i can tell my experience later wow that that's really amazing to hear um, what about what made you apply and, and how the earthquake had affected you know your career and what you were interested in doing? Uh, thank you so much for for letting us know about about your reasons for applying. Um, my next question is for everyone, uh, but we can go ahead and start with um, Busayomi. Um, I'd love to hear more about your role, about your host organization, and specifically what types of communications and marketing responsibilities and activities um, that you completed during your service with your host organization. Um, thank you very much, Zach. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, I served with um, the Transparency and Accountability Initiative. And we, at the organization, we are all about, uh, we are actually a donor collaborative, um, which consists of, um, donor organizations that are funding TPA issues. TPA, by TPA, I mean transparency, participation, and accountability issues. So as a communication officer for um, TA High, I led internal and external communication efforts, and I collaborated with um, communication officers um, working with the donor organization to amplify um, the work that we do at, across different countries. I also led the planning and creation of and dissemination of um, organizational resources, including um, TAI weekly newsletter, which has become highly recommended among field partners. And to encourage learning among um, philanthropists and other people working in the transparency and accountability field, I initiated the TPA full disclosure series, featuring individuals, uh, program officers, working on funding transparency and accountability issues to foster good governance and um, combat corruption in different parts of the world. And this series has um, actually helped to um, humanize and shed more light on the collective work we do and to also celebrate individual commitment and tenacity towards making our society a better place. Amazing. Thank you so much for talking about some of your responsibilities at your host organization. All right, perfect. Well, Shinjini. Again, I'd love to hear again about um, your role at your host organization and the types of communications and marketing activities you did during your service and are currently still doing with your host organization. Sure, Zach. Uh, so I'm, um, as I said, I'm with SAP, which is a software company, and I am, uh, I take care of marketing and communications for their corporate social responsibility team. And uh, this is the this is a global team. So I work with colleagues across the world, which is fascinating. And um, I uh, lead uh, communications for certain uh, global, uh, for a global partnership with UNICEF. And uh, I also take care of certain communication strategies and collaterals for their regional initiatives. Uh, then there is a bit of brand coherence that I do. There's also representing the CSR team to uh, other teams within SAP so that, you know, we, we as a company can speak as one voice so there's a lot of um, it's a lot of interesting work and definitely work that i haven't done before so it's been a great learning experience for me and i would um, and i and i and i love doing what i do amazing well thank you so much for for that um perfect and miguel uh, same question to you um your role at american red cross and and what types of communication and marketing activities did you do Yes, so my role at the American Red Cross was to be a communication uh, and community engagement fellow. But the community was not in, in the field, it was in the digital platforms. So I was managing the preparecenter.org, that is a website that the, the American Red Cross has with this um, um, reference center named Global Disaster Preparedness Center. And in that, I was the I was providing content, uh, working on social media campaigns specifically for different uh, types of disasters, starting with the hurricane season, for example, which is very 
um, common and it happens every from well from July to September in in the United States and also in the Asia Pacific region. And um, I was working as well with uh, different developing some different project products, for example, for children specifically. And we we create a uh, this this recent time that was after the, the fellowship, but we also linked all the work that I was doing as a fellow after uh, I joined them as a consultant with American Red Cross. And we worked for one specific uh, project with four children. It was a uh, kid's kit for COVID-19 uh, prevention measures. And that was interesting because that's, what, uh, that's when we were thinking on the different communities, different audiences, I will say. So, and in general, I could say that uh, uh, the Global Disaster Preparedness Center at the American Red Cross and all that were different projects uh, developing blog posts, uh, working on different uh, design materials like brochures, uh, social media campaigns, uh, one pagers. And we also create an international campaign for the Disaster Risk Reduction Day. And it was launched where well, giving the, 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 the communities the voice to tell what how they are preparing their communities for different disasters. So it was it was really engaging with an international audience, and that's why I can I can relate to what Shinjini says. Like I love my experience working at the, um, serving at the American Red Cross and my host organization. Amazing, yeah. I love hearing this theme about having that that global that global impact um, through your communications and learning different communication styles. Um, so that's really cool. And and Miguel, you know how your your role is combined with community engagement around the world. I think that's very impactful. Um, perfect. Well, my next question is for. I'm Shinjini, and I'd love um, if you could tell me about a professional accomplish that you're really proud of um, from your fellowship. That is a very interesting question, Zach, and it's slightly difficult to answer as well, because um, I'm not sure there's just one. <laughs> so, uh, but I'll tell you about one. I mean, I've, I've not... Uh, always been the most uh, technologically advanced person really and I've been uh, always a little afraid of uh, dig digital platforms that I've never used because I I would think oh my god I've never used this I won't be able to but uh, at SAP thanks to a, a really wonderful manager and a great team that I work with <laughs> who I mean they are they are just so wonderfully supportive people uh, we, we use some platforms like Jam and Jumag and Sprinkler, and I uh, managed to manage to learn the basic workings of those within weeks, which is which for me is an accomplishment because I never thought that I would use those platforms, you know. And um, and a second thing I'll throw in a bonus <laughs> accomplishment, a second thing that um, I am proud of is uh, at least I'm happy about is the fact that I've learned to work with so many different teams across such a big company and uh, learned to uh, manage my professional relationships so well uh, so that you know there is uh, there is coherence across the work that we do and there is a certain synchronicity of uh, across all the relationships and the professional equations that we have Great. I love that learning how to use new um, digital media platforms. <laughs> uh, that is definitely a highlight I hear from many fellows about how they're learning different tools and softwares and platforms um, and how that enriches their professional development. Uh, well, thank you for, for um, remarking on, on some of your accomplishments. Uh, I'd love if you could tell me more about that. <laughs> uh, sorry, Zach, I think I lost a bit of what you said. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'd love if you could um, tell me more about the communications campaign that you led with UNICEF. That seemed exciting to hear, oh, too. Um, <laughs> right. So um, SAP has a global partnership with UNICEF where we work in uh, India, Vietnam, and Turkey. And it's about so uh, amongst uh, in the 
CSR, the CSR portfolios that we have, one of the things that we focus on is digital skills. So this partnership basically, uh, you know, aims to impact about 1.5 million youth in three years, and uh, it is contextualized. So it's um, it. It, so the nature of the program is not the same in India, Turkey, and Vietnam. It is contextualized based on the needs of every country and every situation. So what I do um, as a comms fellow with SAP is lead and coordinate the communications uh, for the partnership on behalf of SAP. So all so all the coordination that goes on with the UNICEF team and um, any uh, cross amplification that we do, any partnership content that we have to create. So I do it with them. And uh, and a part of my job is also to you know take up a uh, key UN days, the fo the focus day, say for example World Youth Skills Day, and create a camp social media campaign around that, uh, because those days are important to us as a CSR team when it comes to the work that we do. Amazing. Well, thank you for telling us more about the that specific uh, partnership and campaign with UNICEF. Great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and move on to my next question. And um, Busayomi, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. Um, how have you grown as a communications and marketing professional because of this fellowship um, experience? And if there's a new software you learned or a professional skill set within communications and marketing that you developed, feel free to, to let me know about that too. Uh, great question, Zach. I think, let, let me start from the not from the professional angle, but from the personal angle. So uh, before I came for the fellowship, I and I still am, <laughs> I used to be this very, very shy person. I don't really like publicity and all that. And I am really grateful for this fellowship because it brings me out of my comfort zone. Um, and thanks to the help of other fellows and also um, staffs at my host organization, they were, they were able to... Um, move me on to actually try new things and um, to be able to um, do things that I used to think, oh, I, I, I can't really do, oh, no, I don't want to be at the forefront of this. And I'm so, I'm so grateful for that. So, um, so professionally also, I was able to build my network, my professional network. And thankfully I work with um, the Transparency and, Organi um, and Accountability Initiative, which is a donor collaborative. So we have me members, um, actually um, leading funders um, who are actually funding issues around transparency and accountability issues. So being able to actually meet people working in that field, be able to um, speak with them, learn from them, um, is actually a big bonus to me uh, personally and to my career as well. And also um, during this fellowship, I was able to do some professional courses. Uh, one of um, the professional courses which I am really grateful for is um, this partnership um, Atlas Co has with um, High MD Business School about the art and science of communication. It really opened my um, understanding into another world of communication. Like there, there is other way of actually communicating your message in a better way. And it really improved my work at TA High and also um, going forward um even post fellowship yeah so and also like shigimi uh, mentioned in terms of i used to say I, i'm kind of tech savvy but <laughs> i think it was like a top notch when i um, joined CAI as well for instance i don't used to use slack uh, before so we communicate a lot um using slack uh, using ever documenting our work on ever notes so being able to use all these um Hubs that actually aid communication um, within organization and being able to learn how to use them effectively um, really, really helped me a lot. Wow. Um, and I, I love that you said you learned like a different style of communication. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah. So um, I remember vividly um, with um, IMD. Um, well, one um, big point um, that was emphasized a lot was the act of listening. And after that um, course, I realized that I wasn't really listening enough as a communicator. I was just all about, oh, let us do advocacy and then put it out. But I wasn't really considering the recipients, um, people at the, at the um, other hand of the message. And that really um, opened my understanding to how we can effectively um, 
communicate this issue and also to always ask the question why why is this important why should people care about it and how can we actually um what tools are actually um suitable for the kind of specific message that we are trying to carry out Mm, that that's great um, to highlight, you know, really listening to who the recipient is. Um, well, perfect. Thank you so much for um, for giving us insight into that. And um, no, I love how you, you know, touched upon some of the softer, you know, personal skills that you're learning. Um, you know, now you're participating in a, in a webinar that'll be watched by, you know, over a thousand people. So uh, really big props to you for that. <laughs> Uh, perfect. Well, I'm going to go ahead and go to you, uh, Miguel. Um, Miguel, again, love to hear how um, you grew as a communication and marketing professionals um, because of the fellowship experience. <laughs> yes, I can, I can also start with the personal side. I think when you grow as a professional, first, first of all, you grow as a person. And I can start um, no just for the host organization, but also for the at the score fellowship, I was able to connect my class. We were, uh, I think we were 12 people from nine countries. So we were like all from different countries. And the first thing that I learned from them what, how, was how to engage and how understand and uh, see other regions, other countries, uh, share experiences, cook together, uh, travel together, different things that, uh, that I think uh, for me, I could say one of the first things that really helped me was to open my eyes to to the world, actually. And when I when that happened, is that you change the way that you think, you understand more things of the world, you learn new languages as well, and I think that that uh, turns that helped me to be more to sympathize with the with the rest of the, of the countries. That of course you see some. Things on the news, for example, you you read you read about things of one specific country, one specific region, but it's completely different when someone tells you how is the real life in that country. And and for me, that that was the the first main experience. And uh, also on on, uh, on the other hand, the professional that also helped me with my professional personal growth was listening actually, because uh, in my case, I I I, I had to de deploy campaigns, for example, for the Asia Pacific region, for the MENA region, for the Americas, for Latin America and all that. And there are, and getting to know that there are many differences, how you post, for example, how you create a layout or a graphic design for the Asia Pacific should be, as, as Eugenie said, for example, more colorful, more uh, different, the messaging in, 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 in Europe, for example, it has to be more straightforward. In Latin America, you have to add uh, some questions, change the change the way that you pr promote is the same campaign, the same idea, but the same concept, I will say, but in, in, di in different formats. The only way that I was able to do that was listening to, to, to the audience. So I was talking to my, counter, my, my colleagues who were deployed in different countries and that helped me, for example, to understand more and, of course, ask all the questions that I have in terms of how this could be effective. Uh, so we can ensure that this, at least, uh, this could help in behavior change in this in these people, for example. So listening for me was the, the key, the key um, tool for, to, to work as, as a professional. And that's how I feel like I, 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 I grow. And on the other hand, and more on the technical side, I could say that we are, well, in, in my case, I was on a non-profit sector, of course, so the, the budgets are limit, limited, sorry. And that's why at some point I had to multitask because uh, you will say that probably I was working here with a team who was doing, a, I have a video producer, I have a, a advertising com company and all that. but. At some point, it was you uh, at the fellowship, and you you were the one who has to also create the videos, also design on on free versions of different softwares, and that's that's also helps you when you know this uh, when you don't have the um, the budget or you you can you become more creative, and actually that's very important in communication because, for example, in my case in communication, risk communication, when you go to the field after an earthquake, for example, 
you cannot wait to have all the software around you and all uh, like deploy five people to the field, but it's you. So you are the one who uh, record the interviews. You are the one editing. You are the one producing social media posts. You are the one doing many things. So at, at some point, I'm, and with multitasking, I'm not saying that you're doing all, at all the, at, the same, at the same time, but you develop different skills and to work with different software as well. And one key thing for me, of course, uh, my experience was before the pandemic, is that I was not uh, very used to work in uh, different platforms, like uh, like you know, my colleague said on Slack and and all this. Uh, for me, it was new. For example, Zoom, uh, uh, different other like uh, uh, co co collaborative tools that we work. And for me, I think that helped me to to be ready to continue working in a remote mode, uh, mode actually during the pandemic. And that was also very useful because I, I've seen how many people, how many professionals have have really struggled with the with, during the pandemic because they didn't have the skill sets, the digital skill sets to work in a remote mode. Mm, yeah, that's very important. Highlighting the, you know, these again, these different tool sets such as um, Slack and other platforms, and how you got to learn that during the fellowship. Uh, perfect. And Miguel, I also love to hear you remark on something that's special about the Atlas Core Fellowship, how, you know, you can you can really get to know people from all around the world and hear their stories um, from your fellow fellows, um, you know, which is, is so much richer than, you know, just reading in the news and adds a lot of perspective. So that's a really important um, benefit of this fellowship. Um, perfect. Well, Shinjini, um, Again, love to hear about you know how you grow grew as a communications and marketing professional because of the fellowship skill, uh, experience and any new software skill that you learned in the field. For me, uh, I I have been I had worked in the nonprofit sector before this, and uh, I have I had been writing for a while. I had written for a media platform. I'd written as a documentation person for NGOs. But uh, when I came to my host organization and I started working as a Marcoms fellow with such a big organization, my I think my key learning was an overall understanding of the processes that go into communication. So it's not just writing. It's also about creating strategies, campaigns. It's a lot about coordination. It's uh, getting information. It's how you uh, get all that information and design it in a way that a message is being sent across. How do you send that message across? What is that message? Is it relevant to people? Who is it relevant to? Why is it relevant? So there are all these questions that you ask as a communications professional. It's not just about writing. And uh, I think that's where I grew most as a comms professional. I gained an overall understanding of what communication looks like, of what the sector looks like, you know? And uh, yeah, that's been my key takeaway. Uh, I have learned more in the last one year and three months than I have possibly learned in in three years before that. And that's saying a lot. Yeah, wow, okay, that that's great. Um, I'm hearing a common theme here. You know, of uh, you know, of learning about different types of communication, um, and how to respond to different audiences, and really asking the question: Okay, what is my um, what does my target recipient want to hear, and, and how do they want that message conceived? So, thank you for all of you for kind of talking about your professional experience and and what you learned um, during the fellowship. Um, perfect. Well, I'm going to pivot to another question, and it's for Busayomi. Um, how has the fellowship enabled you to promote initiatives you care about from back home during or after your fellowship? Sorry, Zach, I lost you in between your question. Can you repeat the question? Oh, yes, yes. Let me go ahead and repeat that. Yeah, um, just wanted to hear how the fellowship enabled you to promote um, initiatives that you care, back, uh, care about from back home um, during or after your fellowship. Great. Um, 
Yeah, so like I mentioned um, earlier when I was talking about my five facts, um, I care passionately about uh, good governance and rural development. And fortunately for me, I got a fellowship with Transparency and Accountability Initiative, which is like their bread and butter. So um, working with um, TEA High, Transparency and Accountability Initiative, we work with um, grantees, I mean, um, civil society organizations that are actually working on anti-corruption issues and promoting good, good governance in Nigeria. So being able to um, put my voice um, into that, even from um, not really in the local, um, from the local point of view, I mean, like within country, but giving it a more international exposure and also pushing for all this anti-corruption reform um, is a big highlight for me. Um, to work on issues that I'm really passionate about. And I'm really hoping to still work more on um, transparency, accountability, and promoting civic participation in my country, Nigeria. Mm. And how does that look, um, transparency, accountability um, in your country? Uh, right now, it's kind, of, <laughs> uh, it's kind of tough. I think um, every country has um, their own um, issue, even if they are operating um, a democratic gov government, there's always room to do better. And that is what we keep pushing um, more of at um, TAI. And that is what I'm passionate about, that our good is not, our good can be better until it is best. And that is something that I want to work on, on how to hold our government, uh, our government um, more accountable to the citizen. Amazing. Uh, well, great. And using your, your communication skills to do that. So that, that's mm -hmm. perfect. <laughs> uh, great. Well, thank you so much for, for highlighting um, how that would look in Ni Nigeria. Um, my last question to um, all of our, our speakers here today is, um, what is some advice that you can give to communications and marketing candidates about the application process or tips for applying? Uh, well, let me go first. I will. My advice is, um, firstly, be yourself. Um, be yourself um, and be articulate about what you do. Um, and also, when you are writing your application, um, focus on the impact. What have you done? No matter how little it is, you might do some things. I remember when I was filling my application and I didn't feel like it was relevant. Um, to include in um, my application, but I was thankful that I was able to show someone else um, to help me look through it, my boss at that time, uh, who is also a friend, um, to help me look through it. And she was like, oh, but you did this. I think it's relevant to it. So sometimes we we think that all these little things that we do doesn't really count. It does. So one is be yourself, um, com um, communicate, be articulate about what you have done, but not just what you have done, but the impact on the community because Atlas is all about impact. So be able to be sure to communicate be sure to communicate that in your application. Also um be particular about your why. Why should um whoever is reading your application, why should they care about what you have done? Why is this important? And also I think be truthful about the skills that you have. Um if you have a guru in Photoshop in whatever technical um aspects um, be truthful about about it and lay everything out there uh, because if you are not really vast in it and you say you are vast in it and then you get posted to an organization and you are asked to prove your words then you start having problems so i would say be truthful put your um best foot forward and um i think best of luck to you as well and also have someone to review your application before you submit it very good Mm, very good advice. Thank you. <laughs> I would um, add to what Busayomi said and really echo what she said, because it is important to play to your strengths. Uh, as a professional who has had some work experience, I am guessing uh, and I'm certain that you have done a variety of things and which is which have uh, led you to apply to the fellowship. So it's important that you really single out what your strengths are and uh, use your uh, communication skills because you, you, you are a marketing and communications professional, right? Use those skills to 
really portray yourself in the best light possible. Uh, speak to your strengths and see how you can uh, portray what you did and did best. That's important. And yes, do get it reviewed by someone before you submit. That's important. Thank you. <laughs> yes, and I think I could, I have just a couple of things to add here is uh, the advices to some research on the host organizations. It's important to see what host organizations are uh, involved in the Atlas Core Fellowship. And, and in, by research, I mean access to their websites, understand how they, they work on communication, what campaigns they have developed, because then is when you can realize that the work that you have been doing in your country, for example, it will be relevant for them as well. So when you have this idea on the, or this connection that how this is working in, in, in the United States or worldwide, for example, how did they work on this campaign and say, oh, I work in a campaign for children education, for example, or in disaster preparedness. So I, I can also put that in my, in my resume, do that because that will help you guide your, the way that you structure your CV, your resume. Otherwise, you, you might think that it's not relevant. That's what uh, Chinjeni and Busayomi said before. But this was just more like an example of how to do it, like do that research. And again, uh, I think uh, having created the application is not something that you can do uh, one night, for example. Start drafting something, start working on something now. Uh, start collecting your ideas what are you what 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 different software do you use as i mentioned before right now it's very important that you can uh, prove that you work on different that you have a uh, different skill sets on especially on, on the digital platforms for example uh, if you if you have worked with different software even if it's a free software put it there because that's useful for them to see that you that you have experience also working with free software or pay software or whatever it is for for communication purposes and and keep 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 adding to that list probably is a draft word document and, and when, when one month or or one month and a half before then you have to write your application because otherwise if you if you let that for the very first uh, for the for the last night, for example, before the application closes. Uh, of course, you you wouldn't get the best information. But that's why I, I I recommend if you are watching this this webinar, take the chance to if you if you feel encouraged to participate in a professional interna international professional fellowship, start drafting some ideas right now, collecting your your strengths, and then write the, the application. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for um, sharing some of your uh, really useful tips for filling out the Alice Core application. Um, so that is it for this section of our um, webinar. Um, if you have a question for any of our speakers, um, feel free to put it in the comment section. Um, we're I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about how to apply and then tips for having a good application to continue this application. And again, at the end, we will have um, any questions from our audience and we're happy to answer them, um, either myself or any of our um, amazing uh, fellows on the call. Um, perfect. Well, I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about the application process. Um, you can see, um, at the bottom of the screen, apply.atlascore.org. Um, that is where you can find out more about the application process. And I also posted in the comment section um, the web page for um, communications and marketing professionals who are interested in the fellowship. So you can um, understand what types of um, skills and ex past experiences that we're looking for, um, many of which were talked about during the um, uh, during our talk with our speakers today. Um, so the application is a multi-step process. And the first step is to fill out an application. Um, it requires a copy of your undergraduate transcript or diplomas um, and two references. Uh, attaching a resume or CV is also encouraged. And you may be asked to submit samples of your work to provide evidence of your professional skills. 
If your application passes our review, you will then be invited to a Skype interview. Um, and after the interview, you would be considered a semi-finalist, considered for potential placement at a host organization. Um, so even if you make it to the final stage as a semi-finalist, you're not a finalist until we send out your, your application to a host organization and the host organization does an interview with you and accepts you as a fellow. We like to match um, fellows with host organizations that are a good fit for their experience and skills. Uh, our priority application deadline is May 16, 2021. And um, our application is open year round. Um, but again, we encourage you to apply by May 16, 2021 to be considered for placements in late 2021 and early 2022. Um, if you don't have your references in by, by then, by May 16th, that's okay. Um, you can still have a little bit while after to submit them. Um, you just won't be moved into the final stage, semi-finalist stage of our selection process until you get those references in. Um, perfect. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about how you can have a good application. Uh, you know, really emphasizing some of the points already mentioned by, by our speakers, um, but also adding some additional points. Uh, so in terms of our skill sets, um, the most successful candidates demonstrate their expertise in a specific skill set throughout their entire application, including their resume, their biography, and the short essay section. Um, in the skill section of the application, um, if you are having your strongest expertise in communications and marketing, that's what you should mark as skill one on the application. And you should provide ample information on your skills and your experiences related to communications and marketing with very concrete um, examples. Um, also demonstrating impact, um, which I believe um, one of our speakers had already mentioned. Um, the work samples you compile, you want to demonstrate your experience and responsibilities in this skill set. Um, so, you know, again, we'll ask for, you know, an example of something that you did in the field that can demonstrate those skills and experiences. Um, if you are an expert in graphic design, um, this skill set should be highlighted again in the essays, biography, resumes, and the work samples that you submit. So. You know, the work sample should be a graphic of, of something that you've done um, in a past role. Um, if your application does not demonstrate at least two years of experience in one skill area, then it is unlikely that your application will be successful. So again, we really are looking for that two years of full-time experience in one skill area. And that is what will make you the most competitive applicant. Um, Something else that's important um, is that the first skill that you mark, you know, you should have the most education and experience, but it's also a skill in which you're looking to further develop during, during the Atlas Core Fellowship Program. Um, each skill has its own set of follow-up questions to dive deeper into your experiences and, you know, answer them thoroughly and use um, statistics and keywords in your response that will ensure your application is matched with appropriate roles and make you a competitive semi-finalist. Um, for eligibility, um, our basic requirements are that you have a bachelor's degree, um, are proficient in English, have two to 10 years of experience, age 35 or under, and are committed to returning home at the end of the fellowship and committed to living on a basic fellowship stipend in the United States. While valuable professions, we do not place applicants who have most of their work experience in teaching, translating, or law. Um, unfortunately, it's just harder to place um, candidates with those types of experience for our fellowships here in the US. Um, and before you're prompted to fill out an application, you'll have the opportunity to take a short eligibility quiz that will help you determine whether you should apply. Um, in terms of English fluency, you should be able to speak English clearly and concisely and have a friend who speaks English um, and who's well read to read over it. Um, again, as was highlighted by many of our uh, fellows on the call today. Um, 
in terms of your bio, that is very, very important for us that you've write a really strong bio. Um, it, it will make sure that you advance farther in the application process. And even when you're a semifinalist, you know, that is what we said to host organizations who are considering bringing you on um, to their team as a fellow. So if anything, make sure that part is read over by multiple people. Um, really, it's about selling yourself. You have 30 seconds to convince a host organization to accept you. What do you want them to know about you? What are the most important um, aspects of your professional career and interests that you can include in that, that 30, um, that, that bio? Um, all right, well, those are the main tips that I have um, for, uh, you know, how you can have a good application in the application process. Um, now we're gonna go ahead and take applications from our viewers. Um, so feel free to, again, post any questions in the comment section, and we'll get to as many as you can. Um, could be about the application um, process or just a tip for our panelists here. Well, one, one question that I wanted to detail was about how the COVID-19 outbreak has affected Atlas Core applicants and semifinalists. Um, Atlas Core is currently accepting and reviewing applications from all countries outside the US for our in-person fellowship um, in the United States. We expect that most and all of our fellows will be placed into this program um, for the full 12 month US fellowship. As the vaccine becomes widely available in the United States and the rate of COVID-19 is lowered, we anticipate being able to bring fellows to the US safely. Uh, we were actually able to um, bring our first set of fellows, nine fellows to the United States um, two weeks ago. Uh, and that was our first time doing so um, since Shinjini came actually uh, in February of 2020. <laughs> um, so we were very proud of being able to do that. <laughs> um, however, if it's not possible to bring individual fellows to the US in 2021 um, due to travel visa or safety guidelines, we will discuss alternative program options uh, with those fellows individually. And it may include our blended fellowship combining remote service with in-person um, service. Um, so how long does our application process take? That's another question that I wanted to answer for everyone. Um, so filling out the application itself can take anywhere from a few hours to a, um, uh, a few days. Um, again, if you want it to be a competitive application, you really want to spend time on it. Um, you know, maybe take a first stab at it um, uh, in a draft form and then, you know, come back to it over the course of a couple of days and get it read by others. Um, so it's up to you to determine how long you spend on the application. Um, we receive thousands of applications each year. I'm going to give each candidate a thorough review. Um, so it may take up to a few months for our team to complete each stage of the recruitment process and accept you to be a semi-finalist. Um, we review candidates not based on the eligibility and quality of their applications, but also on how well you fit with your desired um, profiles um, of the potential host organizations that we're looking for at any given time. Um, so some candidates may advance more quickly through the process than others, depending on what host organizations we um, were partnering with. Our fellowship classes also start approximately four times a year, and that's typically January, April, July, and October. So our next classes will be coming in July 2021 and October 2021. Um, and again, strong candidates who can make it to the finalist stage can be considered up to a year after they applied or potentially longer. Um, and placement may take several cycles. Um, of you know, a finalist or even a semi-finalist is not the same as being a fellow. Don't turn down other opportunities until you received an official offer letter. 
Um, so it's a little bit more detail about um, the dynamics around applying. Awesome. All right. Well, then the final question that I will um, answer is um, about choosing your host organization. And if you can suggest your host organization, if they're not already on the list, um, applicants apply not to a specific host organization, but rather the opportunity to be placed at one of our partner organizations. Um, matching semifinalists with host organizations is a multi-step process, as I as I explained before. Um, once we receive a position description from a host organization, we send them the profile of several candidates that could be a good match. Um, they can pick candidates to interview and may assign additional tasks to you, such as a writing sample, portfolio, or another assignment, um, after which they may pick a candidate for the fellowship or choose not to host a fellow at that time. Um, and these additional requirements uh, would be specified by the host organization and are you know, further um, able to, to gauge what your experience is in, the, in your core skill that you marked on your application. Um, applicants, again, may indicate in their application or interview which ho or host organizations most interest them. However, we can't guarantee placement in any particular organization. Um, in many cases, as organizations may be looking for a specific candidate profile. Um, we ask that candidates do not contact potential or current host organizations unless they've been contacted by the host organization first. Um, if you do already work with an organization based in the U.S. and would like us to send, you know, U.S.-based staff member information on hosting a fellow, um, please send us their contact information at applyatalyscore.org um, and don't contact them yourself about hosting you. Um, I do see another question here that I'd like to, to have answered. Um, as someone who has three years of experience in documentary film and community media uh, for social behavior change, um, working with various um, UNICEF uh, international agencies such as UNICEF, UNDP, even the government of India on gender equality. Um, so yeah, if you can apply in digital social media marketing for media literacy. Um, those are a lot of great experiences that, that you have um, working with a lot of different organizations. Um, what you would do, again, is you'd mark skill one on your application as communications and marketing. Um, we don't um, allow for you to be more specific in that, um, but, um, you know, I encourage you to highlight, again, your digital social media marketing experience. Um, and if you're placed as a semi-finalist, you know, we're going to likely try and match you with the host organization that matches your skills in that media literacy and in that digital media marketing that will allow you to, to deepen that skill even more. Perfect. Well, um, we're almost coming to our end here. Um, so I wanted to see if any of our speakers today have any um, further piece of advice um, that they'd like to give to our viewers. So go ahead um, and feel free, Miguel, Shinji, and Sammy, if you have any last tidbits for our, our crowd. <laughs> yeah, I could share one, one more thing that uh, every time you apply for, for, for this, and, when, when you apply, sorry, for the Atlas Career Fellowship, speak up. I mean, if you have a social mission in your in yourself that you really want to learn more about uh, one specific social issue and you want to learn what what's how they work on that in the United States and then after go to your country and implement that, speak up. If you have your initiative, speak up. Like try to bring your your ideas also to the host organization. You never know what what's going to happen the next year. So don't be shy. Just speak up your social mission, your ideas. Your be creative, and and that's all for me. And and congratulations if you're deciding to go to this step because it's a huge step in your professional life. Amazing, thank you so much, Miguel. I agree with what 
Miguel said, and I would also say if you are selected, it's a it's a great opportunity, and um, I hope you treat it like a learning experience. Uh, do not, uh, and and I hope that you do not come into it uh, thinking that, I mean, believing that you are an expert at everything, but also believing that you are that you do not know as much as there is to know because this uh, opportunity teaches you so so much so much more than you would ever imagine amazing thank you so much Let me uh, say I, mm -hmm. okay um i just i think M miguel and shigini has um said um some of the important things but i just want to um re-emphasize that um the fellowship is an opportunity for you to unlearn and learn some things. So when you come, don't think that you are perhaps a lot of the man or you already know it all. Because this is um, always give room for learning. Because um, there are different ways of doing things. And what you, what the method you think you know how to do things might not actually be the total right way of doing things. So always give room for um, more learning. And also, um, when you submit your application, you might be stuck in the semi-finally um, list um, for a while. I think there are some cases like that. Don't give up. Keep doing um, the amazing things that you are doing in your country. And uh, good luck um, when you are called um, to serve. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Miguel, Shinjini, and Busayomi for sharing your experiences today. Um, we're going to start reviewing applications soon, so apply early. Um, it may take several months and maybe even longer to get through the thorough and competitive application selection process. So again, apply by our uh, deadline, our priority application deadline of May 16th, uh, 2021. Um, and if you have any questions um, on our website, we have all of our frequently asked questions answered. Um, and if that doesn't answer your questions, you can apply, email apply at atlascore.org with the subject line question from webinar participants. Um, again, thank you so much. Um, and we have more webinars throughout the month uh, featuring different fellows with different uh, skill sets that we're prioritizing for this recruitment cycle. Um, so we hope to see you then or um, you know, have, have your colleagues, your friends attend. Uh, again, thank you so much for, for coming and watching us today. And I hope you have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you.